Wayne Perry, Making a Murderer, Part 1. There are quite a few videos on YouTube that cover the Wayne Perry story, but I noticed that none of them actually spends time analyzing and breaking down his childhood, as well as the moment when Wayne transformed into the hitman that we all learned about. So with this video, I wanted to examine and cover as much information on the young Wayne as possible, visiting his childhood neighborhood and a few other spots he roamed while painting a clear picture as we go. Before doing this video, I swept through every court document pertaining to Wayne Perry that was made public. I searched all the information that was available through Google as well as reading the book on his life written by Seth Ferranti. In fact, I read it twice for obvious reasons. I mean, I'm doing the video. I became so into the case surrounding Wayne, almost in a monomaniacal matter, straight up. Some of the scenes, meaning the murder scenes, found its way into my dreams. More importantly, it made me look at life completely different. But I tell you this, I understand how some actors carry certain roles with them for a while. After living the characters, drowning in those scripts and acting out parts, in order to understand something, sometimes you have to strip yourself of everything you know and do and dive in completely. But this ain't no movie, and Wayne Perry is a real person, a very, very complex person, nevertheless, real. The area where Wayne Perry grew up, he lived on L Street as a kid. L Street Southwest. Right here. This is where Wayne grew up at. But yeah, this is it, man. WP's old stomping ground. All up here. Look like they done, they had turned it all down and boarding it up now. That's basically the recreation center right here. Open football field. Public Housing Authority, District of Columbia Housing Authority. Football team, you guys practicing. I didn't even walk through this way. I think people still live in some of these places right here. So let's give a quick little backstory on Wayne's family. Like most blacks from DC and other cities, they were a product of Southern roots, coming from Georgia. Wayne and his siblings were some of the first in his family tree to actually grow up in DC. You see, the Great Migration came after World War II, 
and by 1957, black folks were a majority in D.C., making the city the first black majority city in the country, later nicknamed Chocolate City. Wayne Perry and his family were a part of the second wave of Southern folks moving into the city. As with most people at that time, the reasons for leaving their hometown were, of course, to escape racism and hopes of a better life in general. You got the Great Migration. Wayne Perry was born in 62, just five years later. Why do this matter? Because when you are analyzing someone, you need to know the entire background, the influence, and the landscape because it all tie in and contribute defining who we are, or in Wayne's case, who we become. One of the first questions a doctor asks when trying to diagnose someone is about their family history and habits. The more you learn, the more you understand, and the easier it is to pinpoint solutions. So since Wayne was born in 62, that means he was six years old when Dr. King died, a time period when blacks were fighting for equality. We had more unity and we were very, very religious. Most blacks went to church during this period. This may be the most peaceful, non-threatening portion of Wayne's childhood from a personal standpoint. Due to being so young, having a father, and being preoccupied with sports and school early on. One of the advantages that Wayne had that probably shaped him to become a leader in the streets was his back and forth summers he spent in Georgia around older, wiser family members and also having a father. Most kids in low-income communities only get a chance to see the neighborhood they come from. Rarely do they see the fathers in the house. And this was well after the Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society, which I won't get into, but I'll quickly explain for those who may not know what the Great Society is. The Great Society was policies created by Lyndon B. Johnson to specifically help black households, which was welfare, but they made it where black fathers could not be present if mothers received any help, which resulted in women feeling like they can have however many babies and not have to worry because the new daddy would be government assistance. And what started out as a good idea potentially helped ruin the black household, and by the 70s, the effects was quite evident. Even today, 70% of black children are being raised by single mothers, some of them even glorified as being strong and independent. But that's another story, maybe a good topic for another video. Moving along, the transition in Wayne Perry becoming the vicious man really started in the early 70s. The contributing factors were of course poverty, and where there's poverty, there's crime. Crack wasn't around yet. The major drugs on the streets was heroin and cocaine. In the 203 community in Southwest, you had all types of people roaming the streets. Junkies, hustlers, murderers, prostitutes, and of course, working folks. Wayne was only 10 years old at this time and very aware of his surroundings, becoming a sponge to the streets as he began to indulge. Wayne learned wisdom from his elders, logic from his father, patience from his southern roots, and his murderous ways from guys like Lot, who was like a big brother to Wayne. Wayne would go on to become militant, going above and beyond a typical murderer, but that's later on in his street run. By age 11 and 12, all of the qualities that Wayne obtained served a purpose and made him stand out from most young guys. Lop, as I mentioned earlier, was Wayne's mentor, and Lop was a straight up savage himself. He and other older guys took a liking to young Wayne, but it was Lop that gave Wayne a nickname, Silk. By this time, Wayne was fully entrenched in the life. He was not only watching the backs of older hustlers doing their thing uptown in areas, which we will go and visit later, but he also ran his own crew of younger guys on the streets of Southwest. Now you may be wondering where was his father doing all of this? Information on his mother is not known, so where was his dad? Did he know of Wayne's street ties? How was an 11 or 12 year old able to do so much without their parents stepping in? Well, there's no book on parenting. You learn as you go, and sometimes as a parent, when you are hit with certain facts about your child, you try to lecture them, advise them, and sometimes you even get frustrated and retreat when you feel there's no turning back. No parent is perfect. Some have their own demons and struggles to manage. Some parents don't realize their child is gone, lost to the streets until it's too late. So you go with the wind and let Mother Nature run its course, while keeping your fingers crossed that after the storm, the foundation will still be intact. Oh 
Oh, this is 715. Oh, I got to turn down here because I'm going to have to get out somewhere. Damn. The Howard Theater. I got to get that corner shot real quick. So right here, that's the infamous uh, Howard Theater. Well, all you guys who not from the area, y'all know that stuff when y'all see it. This is the Seven to T area right here. I want to get a shot. So what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna show. I'm gonna show the old Seven to T, and I'm gonna show y'all the new Seven to T. Um, you can see it side by side of the signs and everything. It's completely different. You even look at that sign right there where it say Chuck Brown Way. So Wayne Perry was down here watching um, older guys' backs. And keep in mind, he was only like 12, 13 years old, looking out after dudes who was like 19, 20, 21 years old, right here in this area, right here. And it's completely different if you look around, look at it. So I'm gonna show that what it looked like back in the 70s when he was doing his thing. It's completely different now. Some of it's still the same, but it changed and they added that little Chuck Brown way right there. Y'all see it? So it's hard to believe that he was out here just roaming, um, looking after them older people like that, man. Like how can a man be so advanced at 12, 13 years old doing everything that he was doing? Um, only thing I could chuck it up to, well, you'll see the video, so you'll know exactly um, all of the things that he was involved in and how it happened and all of that. But yeah, this was the area, 7th and T. And the old photo that I have, or that I'm gonna show, you'll see like this whole area, this is a Wells Fargo. This train was like broken down completely. Like, I don't even know what, what type of building it was at first, but um, it, it was just, just dog completely and then now it just look a whole lot more live a whole lot more brighter there are many young kids 11 and 12 who are lost to the streets the shoulda coulda woulda theory is easy to mention when you are not in the shoes of the parents <laughs> And he was running a little group of hooligans, I guess is as good a term as any, who were stealing uh, purses and wallets from, uh, he called them old ladies uh, who were government employees around Southwest DC. And he would take their, wa or their, their wallets and their purses and give the credit cards and the identification information to his cousin, who was, uh, it, it sounded to me, and, and I verified it later when I, I did a uh, criminal check on his cousin. Was a who uh, uh, was involved in, in check boosting or, or you know fraudulent uh, ID stuff and and busting phony you know credit cards and all that kind of thing. He was doing all sorts of scams. Uh, Perry said uh, that I was supposed to just stay there with the guy so that my cousin could go off and get him, uh, uh, develop a, uh, uh, an alibi. And then I was supposed to ask the guy to, to buy me an ice cream or something like that, just to get him walking away from the house. And I could shoot him anywhere I wanted to along, you know, along that route. And that was the plan. And Perry followed the plan, you know, right away. And he, he said he walked uh, with the guy down to this little mom and pop grocery store uh, in the neighborhood and watched him walk into the basement and as soon as his head got at the level that he could see you know, just nothing but the back of his head he pulled the gun out and, and emptied it into the guy's head The year is now 1974 Wayne Perry aka Silk is only 12 years old he is now equipped with all of the mechanics to make himself a murderer calculated and full of heart this is the year that alters the course of his life for good. This is the first time Wayne kills someone. 
His first order coming from a cousin of his who wanted his partner dead. The deal was Wayne get to keep the gun, which was a revolver. This was to take place in the Wood Ridge area off Row Island Avenue. His adrenaline was rushing, yet he was focused on the task and seeing it through. Walking slightly behind his target as they head towards a mom and pop store on the avenue, Wayne clutched the revolver that's tucked away in his pocket. His target began to walk down the stairs. Wayne got closer and closer almost perfectly in stride with the target. And just like a lion hunting his prey, Wayne attacked. He pulling out the revolver and pointing it at the back of the guy's head and then squeezed the trigger. Target down. Wayne Silk Purry, making a murderer. Part one. <laughs>